them uh, simultaneously or at the same time. First, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Santiago Pascual, Alberto Marola, and Kevin McGuinness, who have been my predecessors in teaching this lecture at UPC. I hope I can do as much good as they did in the past. In the case of uh, Santi, you have um, his lecture recorded, so I invite you to watch it also. So today, what we're going to do is to uh, kind of change a little bit the story so far. Mainly, we've been talking about discriminative modeling, and today we'll be talking about generative modeling. Uh, GANS is just one specific case of generative modeling, um, but there are others. But today, I'll focus on GANS. And you'll see that it's pretty funny because we'll be able to make our models to be a bit creative. So let's first define generative models and what's here. So, so far, basically, we've been looking at these two types of problems. Most of the time, we've been looking to classification of regression problems. So when we're looking at text, maybe we're trying to find the sentiment of a tweet or looking at the image and figure out like what the sentiment of this cell over here or what's the language that's being spoken. So that would be like classification. Sorry, this one will be not said, it will be like classifying the name of the actor. And about regression, maybe we we're looking at, at on checks by looking at the at the profile of a of a person. We, we may be able to estimate the probability of that person to be a potential customer. Or if we are trying to regress bonding boxes on images to detect faces, that would be a regression task we, we can address. Or if we are trying to go from one language to another, we could think that that's a regression task. Although I guess we can discuss a bit on this. But today, what's important is. Today, we want to generate data. We want to generate new data. So we want to write checks that looks realistic, or at least that it's useful. OK, so this text that you see here, it's uh, kind of generated. And it's supposed to be kind of related about uh, Harry Potter books. So at least there's a word Harry, there's a word Ron. What about Ron Magic of Ron? Harry Ron was a lot slow and soft bird. I don't like to think about bears. So it's a weird uh, statement, but because it's basically generated by a machine, and maybe at this point doesn't make much sense. Also, there are like images we can generate. They look very realistic, but they are these people do not exist. Or we can even just uh, use these models to generate new music, to compose and interpret new music. You can click here for a sample of it. So that's what we're going to be focused on on generative modeling. So in the past, uh, we basically what we try to do uh, is to predict uh, labels out of data, but now that's not what we want. What we want now is to model the distribution of data uh, so we can sample new samples out of it. There's still going to be a training data set. We still need some data to train our model. So we'll take our training data set. Imagine we have training, a large training data set of faces of people, and from that, Training the set, what we would like to do is to learn some uh, distribution, data distribution, or some manifold in the data space so that if we have it properly um, defined, we can generate new samples out of it. We can uh, generate this kind of uh, faces of people that do not exist. Not only that, not only we can generate New samples, but we'll be also be able to interpolate from one sample to another. For, for example, here you see how you can move from one phase of a famous character into another one. And that's because in this data space, we'll be learning, we'll be able to, let's see, interpolate to generate samples between any two points of this space we are learning. Okay, so you can see here all the evolutions. In a less fancy but maybe more clear way, here you see what we'll be trying to do. Uh, we'll still be trying to model uh, our network with some parameters. In our case, they are going to be weights, they are going to be biases. And we are going to, um, based on these weights and biases, to go to model the data of our model, hoping that the probability of distribution of data of our model will match the distribution of our trained data that sometimes we will refer to it as p of data or p of x 
If you can do that, later we'll be able to sample new ones. For example, imagine that we have this, this joy example in which our training examples are the samples in green. As you can see, the samples in green, they seem to follow a Gaussian distribution in the sense that most of the samples are in the center, not that many in these queues. So by looking at this data, it will be possible to estimate the, the mean, the standard deviation, and with these two parameters, we could predict the distribution, the distribution, and if we have the mean and the standard deviation, we can also generate new samples that follow, in this case, a Gaussian distribution. However, in our case, we'll be uh, not be assuming that we have a Gaussian distribution. We have a neural network that can uh, approximate any function, or at least as a theory, right? Or at least very complicated uh, functions, much more complex than a Gaussian one. If we can do that, we'll be able to generate uh, very uh, realistic data. Again, let me insist, this is not about an architecture, so don't expect a recurrent layer or a graph you neural know, network as Javi presented in the previous lecture. This is just uh, a concept of how, what our generative model is, and in particular today uh, with GANs, uh, I will not really focus a lot on any architecture. You see that most of my examples, they are uh, based on convolutional neural networks because we'll be dealing with images, but that doesn't mean that you need to use convolutional neural networks to generate data. You can, for example, use these graph neural networks that Javi mentioned. So once we have that, if we are able to generate, uh, to distribute, to model our data distribution, be able to generate uh, samples of any dimensions. So for example, imagine that we want to generate a speech uh, signal, you can see that now we, our speech signals, they are placed, located in some space of n dimensions. You can think about that. Or what about images? You can think that images, if you just read them pixel by pixel, uh, in this case, it would be like 32, by 32 pixels and three channels. You, can, you could just put them all together, uh, just one next to another, just flatten it, and then enroll it. And then you can consider that an image is not more than a point in a high dimensional space. Okay, so whether speech or image or any data, you can in the end think, imagine that it's a point in a high dimensional space. And in that high dimensional space, we can try to estimate the distribution of the data. If we do that, we'll be able to uh, generate new samples uh, from the, our data distribution of our uh, approximator. Notice what we want to do is to generate samples that they were not in the training data set. Okay, we are not, again, as in discriminative task, we don't want to memorize, memorize our training data. What we want to do is to learn some parameters that will allow to generalize well. So in this way, to be able to generate uh, new data that look realistic. The example, you have these training examples that were used to train a neural network that later may be used to generate new samples like this one. Let's look at some motivating applications so that you see what I'm talking about. One application could be like super resolution. I guess that's that's not, not this work in particular, but one of the other work, previous work, uh, that kind of showed the interest in terms of GANs for applications was super resolution. resolution. Imagine you have an image or a video in low uh, spatial resolution. That's what you have in the input on the left and on the right you have the output of a, a GAN, GAN-based model that it uh, has interpolated, let's say, the missing pixels in a much much better way than just what a linear interpolation would do, right? It, there are, there's a lot of detail that has been added and it's based on a previous learning process that the model did. This work actually was uh, co-authored by Laura Leal, who's a former uh, student from our university at UPC. Or what about image translation? Uh, this other work, what it shows like by having uh, individual labeling of pixels, that's the first uh, image that you see, that's called the semantic map. So each color corresponds to a class. For example, the blue color corresponds to the class car. You can feed that into a GAN so that it's going to generate a realistic view of a scene that uh, matches the pixel labeling that we, we can generate. So that's a, that's a way, for example, to generate new training data. If you have a simulator, 
you don't need to have a very super high resolution simulator as long as it's good at doing the, the physics part. Uh, you can have a simulator for autonomous driving, generate a large amount of data, even if it's as simple as this, as this child, and then have a gamma job that will actually produce uh, visually realistic uh, uh, output uh, of the video sequence. And again, we can have like um, a lot of data for training our neural networks. Oops, sorry. This uh, one of the uh, also following on the idea of generating faces. That's a more recent uh, work called Stalgan, in which they managed to uh, let's say uh, transfer style between this case of faces, or there are also like examples with uh, of animals or, or stuff, as you can see. Uh, so in the in the first uh, column, they are all generated synthetic faces. Okay. So they are always a, a male person wearing glasses, second one, a female person wearing glasses, third row, uh, child. Uh, also like a similar pose and in face expression. Um, so you, we, we can transfer actually um, attributes, facial attributes or, or skin attributes across different synthetic faces. Okay, totally uh, generated. Okay, that's the example of the animals I had in mind. That's from our work, uh, a Stargun. It's kind of a similar approach, uh, more recent. As you can see, um, you can, it doesn't limit only to faces. Here you can, they use it for a uh, broad amount of domains. I mean, in this case, that's animals, right? But all these images that you see uh, generated, um, they don't exist in reality. What about uh, if we go to video? Uh, in this work, imagine you have a source subject that's being recorded, doing some motion, and then a target subject that you collect a training data set. And then after that, what you're going to do is you have the source video here on the top left, or over here, so this here. Okay, the cursor doesn't move, but it's this server here. And the lady in blue, uh, that was automatically generated, I will start again. Here you, you have, again, the source subject, and this motion is transferred to this lady, is a training data set, okay? And now what you see, uh, the big screen is a source to target result, okay? In this case, they went through uh, the detection of the pose. Uh, you know, to do that, and later I'll show you like another application that we developed at UPC uh, based on this algorithm. Another interesting application would be like for speech enhancement. In many situations, the spoken words, they, uh, they are, they suffer distortion. And maybe there's a, a cut in the communication. Maybe you are speaking on the phone. At some point, there's some, uh, data packet loss at some point, or maybe you are in a concert or a recording studio and some part of the data was missing. And it's possible to reconstruct or clean, to clean up the data with uh, generative uh, models. Okay, this will be uh, one of the best paper awards in 2017 in CFVR, which actually they, that was, that was what I mentioned earlier, that they use it uh, GANs to uh, generate synthetic data. That's an, uh, one of the few papers from by Apple. So what they did is they wanted to have a large data set for eyes. As you can see, this eye is synthetic. If you notice, it looks synthetic. When they use a GAN just to uh, refine the synthetic data. Uh, so this way they, they had much more training data, like as much training data as they wanted because they could uh, generate any eye uh, gaze they wanted and then just refine it to make it realistic. Yeah. Any question about application so far? If not, I'll move into explaining how, how this is done uh, with deep neural networks. So the work uh, now, it's a work whose first author is Ian Goodfellow, now at Apple from 2014. And it's a technology that has like six year old now. And if you read uh, his, one of his, uh, Nice tweet some years ago. He shows like the in the on the left, you can see the quality of the first samples. So in 2014, that's the quality that the faces being generated by GAN uh, had. And this the evolution in four years, 2017. And actually earlier I showed you like even more recent evolutions of, of that. So you can see that this field has uh, evolved very quickly and that uh, it will probably still evolve much faster in the in the future because it's a very um, convenient way of generating data. 
this, uh, for example, one of the of these examples of, that are well known, that's called the big gun uh, model was presented last year in iClear. And you see that the quality of images is, is much better than what we had in 2014. So since 2014, there has been, as, as this chart says, kind of a gun ep epidemic. There are like so many scientific works uh, focused on guns. Uh, actually now nowadays as well, um, products like apps or software that it's uh, exploiting this technology uh, for video manipulation, for content generation, artistic creations. And there are many opportunities for you if you're interested. Let's see how it works. Um, Genetic fiber cell networks, as you notice, it talks about networks. So there will be not only one network, but two, okay? So that's more or less what the image I would like to, to have of each. Uh, we'll be having like two networks. One of them is the generator. And another network is called the discriminator. And they will be kind of fight, fighting each other. And our goal actually as a data scientist will be that none of them wins, okay? Actually, we would like them to just keep fighting as, as much as possible because the more they fight, the stronger they get and the better they get. So let's see exactly what are they fighting about. Um, so when they are fighting, they are learning. So it means that we will be estimating the parameters of two uh, deep neural networks, okay? And they will have like uh, contrary goals, the two, each of the two networks. So the, when I talk, talk about G, I will refer about the generator. And when I talk about G, I refer to about the discriminator. Then the mission for G, for the generator, will be to fool the discriminator, to cheat it. So the discriminator, discriminator makes a mistake in a classification task. What is the classification task for the discriminator? The discriminator will need to decide whether a new data sample, let's put, a, for example, an image, but again, it can be a text, a speech, whatever, okay? But let's say that you have a sample that was produced by the generator, so the generator is actually the one that produces the samples. Um, so the discriminator will need to, to give a sample to decide if that sample was produced by the generator or if it came from a training data set. So remember that I mentioned that we still need a training data set. We still need real samples. Good news is that these samples do not need to be labeled. We just need them to be real. So but we don't need annotators, okay? Just collect data, just take your camera, start taking pictures from everywhere that you are interested in the domain, and that's going to be your training data set. No need to label anything. So these contradictory uh, goals, the generator trying to uh, mislead the discriminator and the discriminator actually trying to figure out if a sample was produced by the generator or, it's, or it was a real sample. If, we, if they both learn at the same pace, we'll succeed into training, training uh, genetic fiber cell network, which I warn you now, it's not a piece of cake. They are quite unstable in training. Okay? It's not easy to, to train these models. Let's look at it in, in most detail. Um, so what the generator does, it's going to generate samples that will follow a property distribution, which is the one that we want to make it be as close as possible to the real data distribution. We call this P of data. That's going to be our training data set. Then, so we have a new network, okay, that will be generating samples at the output. We like these samples to follow the same or as, yeah, the same data distribution as the real one. So we, if we want our network to generate cats, we would like the network to generate different cats. So to generate cats, but not always the same cat. We would like it to generate different cats, okay? Then um, what could we do? Like if, let's assume that we have our generator, it's trained, but that we would like to have different outputs, okay? If we can only change the, let's say the input. Because here I'm I should tell you that generator is a network. I talk about the output, but I didn't talk about the input. So what do you think we could use as an input so that at the output, we're going to have different, let's say a diversity 
of generated samples. So what could be the input? You can write on the chat. Or if you all turn your microphone on, that's gonna be recorded. Um, so if you demand turn your microphone on, it's not, you can use the chat, but that's an open question for you. So some ideas, um, we would like some stochasticity here. We don't want the network to always predict the same cat because that's going to be very useless. So how, how could we uh, have some, introduce some, for some stochasticity into the network? So remember the network is, in the end, it's just a set of weights and biases connected with the neurons, whatever, convolutional or whatever neurons. But so far, what you, what you have seen in the, in the course is that when you feed uh, some input sample in a network, once and again and again, the output is always the same, right? Okay, when, when, so when you train your network with MNIST and you show a digit number two and you feed that, uh, image of number two, and then predict number two, and you feed again, you'll predict again number two. It's an example exactly with the same probability. So how can we change that? Okay, great. So there's a, we have, thanks, we have a, an answer finally on the chat. Um, so the suggestion on the chat, which is a very good one, is like we could random, uh, you introduce some random white noise images, which is uh, a good option. I don't think, probably we don't even need, it should be images. I understand that it might be easier, maybe in terms of architecture. So maybe that make it easier. But actually, we don't we don't not even to to have 2D or or, or yet. I mean, it's, never mind. Right? It's just some random uh, noise at the input. And so actually, what we're going to do, like on, on the baseline baseline architecture will be just sampling from some kind of Gaussian distribution. It could be 2D, it could be 1D, never mind. The architecture can take care later of um, make, making sure that the output is 2D and, and, and in color. In this way, we can assure that there's some stochasticity at the output, okay? Um, do, you, do you have, do you know any, any other way so that a network, so the same network, uh, to have some diversity on the output. So one method that you have seen when training neural networks, uh, which was very useful to avoid overfitting, and that probably when we talk about it, they said, use that only on training, never on test. Yeah, so another option would be like dropout. So drop dropout means uh, we kind of turn some neurons off and that's good for as a it's a good tool for regularizing, and that's why we saw that on the part of fighting or feeding. But you could also do that on inference time, and that's going to have like a similar behavior. It will it will also generate a diversity of outputs. Then, uh, so we have a generator that will generate uh, samples, let's say images of cats. Um, so. Who is going to decide if those images are good or bad based on what I explained earlier? This is, a, this is an easy question if you follow my explanation earlier, okay? So generator generates a diversity of images of cats. We have solved this. Now, who is going to decide or assess if those images are good or not that good? Okay, one, one clue for you is like the answer is in the slides with an okay, discriminator. Thank you, great. Uh, so yeah, so so we have it's one generator in part. And now, right now, today, I'll be talking about generative models. Okay, I'm not, you see that I will not pay attention for the discriminator much, although it ha it's very useful for other applications, but today I'll focus on generative models. So kind of the, the discriminator has kind of a secondary role. Okay, but we need it, okay, because the discriminator is going to guide the training of the generator. So we will have is uh, at um, we have another network that will be fed with images, but whether real, whether synthetic, and the discriminator, which is going to be another neural network of can have like 
any architecture, but at the end, basically, it will be classifying between uh, uh, real and synthetic images. So whether the cat is real or not, that's going to be its role. So here you have a, a broad overview of the whole scheme. Uh, let's look at it in, in detail. We have first, these are our real images, our real cats. It's our uh, training data set, real world samples uh, database. And from this branch, so this part is just sampling. So it means taking samples from, from the training data set. And we show real images here. And on the other branch, we have a latent random variable, our noise that we mentioned. We feed that into a generator. That's going to be, again, a neural network, whatever architecture. We don't, don't pay attention to the architecture. It just, this just means whatever architecture. And this is going to generate images, OK? And maybe when it's learning, the cats that it's generating are not that realistic. Maybe it kind of generates more like a new walk or a draft. It's, it's totally like, it's just to make an example, OK? But this will not happen. It will generate some blurry cats. But just to, to explain the story, let's say that generator will must learn how to how to generate images of cats, right? And then we have the discriminator. There will be another real network. Again, never mind about the architecture. A discriminator will be predicting whether the input, so sometimes we'll feed real data, sometimes we feed uh, synthetic or fake data. The discriminator will need to decide with the prediction. As we know, as we will always know, what are we showing to a discriminator? We will always know if the sample we feed here is real or it's fake. We will have kind of a ground truth label and we will to compute a loss to, to compare the predictions of the discriminator with our label. Okay, let's say typically we can think about our label is a one hot encoding, let's say one zero for real and zero one for fake, for example. That could be a, an approach. In terms of architectures, as I mentioned, that you could have like any architecture you can think about. Just here as an example, uh, you have one generator that uh, wants one of the first ones uh, proposed to generate images in which you fed at the input a code of with a random variable of uh, dimension 100 with code Z. And there were like some upsampling convolutions. And at the end, there was an image of, in this case, 64 or 64 and the three RGB channels. This could be one of the first uh, architectures used for image generation. Let's see about uh, how to train these two networks, OK? Well, it's quite clear. We have two networks. We know what we want them to do. Let's see exactly how we train them. So I'll start with an analogy, because this training will be very iterative. Will be, actually will be, uh, it will be kind of a trial and error, especially for the generator. Let's imagine that we have an analogy, which is we have a counter fighter. So this counter fighter, which its goal is to, uh, he wants to create, generate fake money. OK. And then there's the uh, law enforcer or police that will try to stop uh, the counter fighter to generate fake money and to fool uh, its citizens, the rest of the citizenships. OK. So let's, at the beginning, the counter fighter is really bad at generating fake money. And he shows this white rectangle to the, with a 100 written uh, to the police. The police compares the real notes with the fake ones and says, that's very easy, OK? And actually, it kind of gives tips to the counterfeiter, like, OK, it's, not, it's so easy, right? It's not even green, right? So with this information, the counterfeiter will learn to improve its output, its outcome. So now the, the node, it's, it's green. But still, the police says, oh, but there's not, not even a watermark. So it doesn't have this nice logo here. And then the counterfeiter adds a watermark. And now the police says, OK, the watermark should be rounded, and so on, and so on, and so on. And at some point, if, if we manage to train our network networks, the uh, counterfeiter will be able to generate banknotes which are as realistic as the real ones and the policeman will be really hesitating between real fake so when it's pretty real fake the chances that it gets it right it's going to be like totally random like let's say zero five 
So if we, we look at this example uh, with the figure that we show earlier, what we have now are two models which are differentiable. So these are our neural networks that for which we need to estimate the parameters. So we have the discriminator and the generator, and they are um, aiming at different contradictory goals. So how are we going to do the training? So first, what we do is to fix the weights of the generator. Look here, I fix the weights of the generator. Okay, that's this lock, that's what it means. What we do now is uh, with we, so whatever weights that the generator has, the, we start feeding with uh, sampling from our latent variable, our noise, let's say, it's still generating samples. At this point, at the beginning of the training, it, it's, it's really bad, it's just generating random images. While on the other hand, we have real world images like these ones that we show to the discriminator. And now, at this point, what we'll be doing is training the discriminator. So we'll be just computing the loss for uh, these images, for these other images, see the, the prediction of the discriminator, and then back propagate gradients for the discriminator and update the parameters. And we do that for a few iterations. After a few iterations, we change the role. Now we lock the weights of the discriminator. They will not be changing, they are fixed. We unlock the weights and parameters for the generator. We uh, fit the random variable, we generate fake samples. The discriminator does the predictions. And what we want now is just the opposite of, 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 of in the previous case. If, if uh, earlier, when we were showing fake uh, examples for the discriminator, we, we had a loss that was kind of encouraging that these um, images would be labeled as fake. Now we totally change our loss. And now we'll have a loss that will encourage that these, sorry, that the images that come sampled as synthetic, they are labeled as real because now we are training the gen generator. At this point, we don't care about the discriminator. We want the discriminator to do a very bad job. We want to fool the, the discriminator. So now we change the labels and we want the generator to fool the discriminator. So we want that these images that we sample, they are labeled as real. Okay, you need to do this in, in the lab uh, this week. If you look at the expression of mathematical expression of, of this process, that's what's called the minimax objective for a GAN. And I'll explain it to you. It's, I think if you understand the idea, it's quite uh, easy, even it might look a bit intimidating at first. You we have uh, let's say a value function or loss function for GANs. And we have first look, look at there are like two different goals, right? So the, the generator will try to minimize this expression and the discriminator will try to maximize this expression. So let's see what they're trying to do. Let's focus on the discriminator first. So the discriminator, when it looks, when we are sampling data, from the real data distribution. So P data, it means like the, the real uh, distribution. So that's real data. The discriminator will try to maximize this part. So it will try that the output of the discriminator is uh, high. Okay, actually there's, there's a log, but the log is, a, is a, it's an increasing uh, function, okay? So we want, we want it to, to be large. So we'll try uh, that the, the prediction one is the, is the correct one. So we'll, we'll try to predict the, a one. On the other hand, when we have synthetic data, it's going to be just the opposite, right? The discriminator, now let's focus on the discriminator. We have now for the discriminator, it has one minus, and that's the that G of Z. So the Z is the noise. So G of Z is the image that was uh, generated synthetically. So D of G of Z, this G of Z is the synthetic image, while X is the real image. So when we are fed the discriminator with a synthetic image, it will, the discriminator will try to make it uh, small. So that's why we have like a one minus. So 
earlier, earlier we had the discriminator uh, like pushing uh, up towards the, the loss value. Now, as we have a one minus, it's just the opposite direction. On the other hand, if we focus in this term, if we now we forget about the discriminator and we focus on the generator, it will want actually just the opposite of the discriminator. So if the discriminator wanted this term uh, to be, um, so he wanted this term to be uh, large, okay, the generator will try just the opposite to make it small. So we're trying to minimize, okay? So that will be the mathematical expression for Jigan. In a qualitative way, uh, what's happening here and why uh, adversarial loss is held, let's say compared with a mean square, square error solution, is that um, GANs kind of force the networks to take a decision. So if you tried uh, the network with only the mean square error, that's something that we could do. We could, um, when, you know, when we are uh, predicting like this, uh, output one or, one or zero, okay? Um, we could just have a mean square error here to predict, to, to compare as a loss function, okay? If you, we take the loss function as uh, as a mean square error, error, what the network will try to do, it's kind of um, not take a, any hard decision. Like you will try to, to minimize the loss like on average. So when we, Let's say that you, you need to sample images, uh, crops like this, and all of them, they, they kind of look, they are, these are all like real crops, okay, of whatever image, I, I said I don't know what is, what is that. But if, if that's your training data, if the samples in, in red are our training crops, and we use a mean square error based solution, the mean square error based solution, so with no adversarial loss, it will turn to generate samples they are that they are kind of the average because in the end the average solution that's what minimizes the mean square error and then if you try that you you'll end up with samples that don't look realistic but they kind of look blurry on the other hand if we try with uh, gun uh, loss we'll generate samples that are look much more realistic that's what you have observed and actually in many cases what you do is we combine gun adversarial loss with a uh, with an other perceptual loss. Then if you want to train again, there are many tricks. They are very stable to, to train. So I strongly suggest that you look at this tutorial that from Sumit Chintala on how to train again. Okay, actually it was presented in Barcelona, in Europe in Barcelona, it was the year of the Gantt and there was so much uh, hype on this and there were, and he gave a very nice tutorial actually like other speakers also for sure uh, told there. Then um, there's a variation of GAN in which, what if instead of just having a random seed for the generator, why don't we condition the generator? So we kind of, now we want to have some control. Don't just feed noise into the network, but let's, let's, let's try to, to control what's being generated. So what we could do is, I imagine that we have like, um, some condition, let's say a sketch of a, of, a, of a sneaker or of a shoe. And then we would like to have it like to condition the generator so that the output sample, it's, it should match to this condition. So this, in this case of this sketch. That's what's called conditional GANs or C-GANs. And if we train with that, we, we need these pairs for both the real training data and both the generator. Because for the discriminator, we will not only be showing the, gener the real or genetic sample, but we will also show to the discriminator the conditioning uh, scheme, the conditioning data we have. In this render, we will we'll also uh, evaluate actually if the match is correct. If even maybe you have a, a sample that looks very, very realistic, but doesn't match to the condition. And the screener will also penalize that. So this way, the generator will, will learn not only to generate realistic samples, realistic shoes designs, but also the shoe design that matches the condition. This is a scheme that I showed that could be like the original one from uh, Misa and Austin Deiro. And that's kind of some of the words that you uh, may have seen or that you can do 
In this case, you, these are all images of birds and flowers that were generated with a uh, description, a textual description of the bird or flower. One of the most celebrated uh, application of this approach, it's what called the peaks to peaks uh, model in which, as I mentioned, you, uh, we can, can you kind of do something that's called image translation somehow. And in this case, uh, what you show in the, uh, to the generator are pairs uh, of, uh, sorry, you have a like conditioning image and you have the generated one. So you have a, a new version of the image. And then for training, you need to have pairs of what whatever transformation you are trying to do, whatever image translation you want to do. If you go you want to go from grayscale to color, you need to have a data set of images that go from grayscale to color. If you want to draw the map of some, some urban area, you need a data set of real images and, and real maps. And if you do that, you are uh, able to actually train uh, models to translate images in different modalities. OK, just to finish, I'll just briefly present uh, some words that have been developed at UBC that I think it's interesting that you are aware of. Uh, first, in choice, like Victor Garcia, Sandy Pascual, and Junting Pang, which, as far as I know, they were pioneers at UBC in applying GANs. So Victor uh, was working on, actually, with the pix to pix in parallel to the real pix to pix in trying to solve colorization, but they managed to do it uh, much better and faster than we did, but still a very interesting work. Then Santi Pascual uh, was one of the first authors that uh, applied GANs into speech uh, with a model called SEGAN that was uh, used uh, to, for speech denoising, so to clean the, the noise from speech. And Jun Qing uh, used it to uh, improve a model for what's called visual, visual sentence prediction, which means like given an image, try to predict the fixation points of the human case. Later, actually, there was a, as a continuation by another student, Mark sense that not only he was predicting the math, but he was also predicting the um, realistic path over the image of the eye case. And actually, we won a couple of awards with this work. More recently, with uh, our PhD student, Amanda Duarte, a, a master student at that time, uh, Miguel Tubao and Francisco Roldan, we managed to generate images of YouTubers based on the speech. So actually, we built a data set of uh, pairs of uh, frames, detected faces from YouTubers and, and utterances from their speech. And we condition the generation of faces with a speech we extracted. More recently, even uh, we have this work from Lucas Ventura and, and Amanda Duarte, in which what we do like this human transfer that I showed earlier for slang words, as you can see on the left, we have a source video that is transferred to the lady on the left. Okay, and we are working on this again, as in the first word that I show you, that's based on first extracting uh, joints from the body. From another group from the Institute of Robotics, uh, Industrial in Robotics, IRI, uh, there's this word that's very well known called Ganimation, in which Albert Kumarola and the rest of the team, they managed to uh, change the facial expressions in a continuous manner. Um, this work Actually, it was awarded two years ago in ECCB. That's one of these very big conferences in artificial intelligence. And he received the paper honorable mention. Unfortunately, it was not in the front cover of our media, but at least now you can see it in the slides and you can be aware. If you can see Albert or Frances, you can congratulate them for the excellent work they did. Oops. Yeah, and uh, more recently, also Albert had uh, this work last year in which uh, he was transferring clothes from one person to another. So you can see here you have uh, the popular uh, shirt from Mark Zuckerberg. So actually he was doing an internship at, at Facebook and he kind of made everybody wear the same T-shirt, as you can see. So that will be it uh, for today. If you want to know more here, there's like uh, a very basic talk or very short uh, report that where Santi and me uh, talk about guns uh, to the Catalan TV a few years ago and when they were very concerned about deep fakes because this, that's the kind of technology that powers uh, deep fakes. And maybe much more interesting, you can uh, watch a tutorial from I am Goodfellow here in our hometown Barcelona. Of course, at that time, nobody here in the media totally ignored that, but it was a very important thing that this technology actually 
exploded and got very popular uh, after this conference at, at this uh, New Ribs in Barcelona. So that would be it. I'll stop the recording now. So if you have questions and you are shy, that's going to be a great moment to pose your questions.